So Dr. Daniel, um, as we uh, get started here, just wanna say thank you for, for joining us. You can see, I know you've been on for a while, you can see we have an engaged group. So thank you for joining us and the, the floor is yours. Well, uh, my pleasure. Thank you for uh, the, uh, the privilege to be part of this uh, wonderful, uh, wonderful meeting and uh, congrats for the uh, amazing fight you're, you're putting. Um, so uh, thank, thank you for what you're doing. And it's a pleasure to share with you today um, how uh, a multidisciplinary or a team approach is, is uh, so much better um, to fight uh, and uh, win over uh, um, issues like dysphagia and uh, drooling. Um, I don't seem to be able to advance my slides, but I will see. If you, if you click one time on the slide and then you should be able to use your arrow keys. There we go. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Uh, and here are my disclosures. And uh, hopefully uh, by the end of this talk, uh, we would have identified some of the etiologies for drooling and dysphagia and um, touch on to how a multidisciplinary care uh, can be uh, so helpful to patients with drooling and dysphagia, as well as uh, touch upon treatment options uh, for these conditions. Uh, wh why do I bother to talk about drooling and dysphagia at this venue? Um, and and I, I've um, been really fortunate to be uh, part of the first Canadian National Conference on Leukodystrophies. And um, uh, I um, have a lot of admiration for the work of uh, Dr. Bernard and what she's done with her team. And uh, uh, at that venue, uh, we uh, were privileged to meet a cohort of uh, a uh, number of patients and uh, uh, 12 patients with local dystrophy uh, have kindly agreed with us and, and share some of the uh, issues um, that uh, uh, children and adults with local dystrophies uh, face. And, and in this uh, uh, group that we met, uh, eight out of 12 uh, mentioned that drooling was an issue uh, for them. Uh, out of those patients, um, uh, about a third had undergone medical or surgical therapies for drooling. Uh, four patients had experienced at least one aspiration pneumonia. Uh, and then, uh, as uh, you know, a large number of uh, patients have uh, dysphagia uh, and uh, some uh, require a feeding tube or a thickening of feet. Um, and then this uh, data is uh, published. I put the um, the, the reference uh, for you. Um, the facts about drooling, it's generally caused by the uh, adult or child's inability to manage their saliva. It's rarely caused by overproduction of saliva. And, and I like to uh, divide it into uh, anterior uh, and posterior drooling. And a lot of um, patients have a combination of anterior and posterior drooling. Uh, so it's important to always think about both types of drooling. And anterior drooling is visible. Uh, you see spillage of saliva from the mouth. Uh, and um, uh, at times it can wet the clothing. And in the winter, uh, this freezes on the clothing, uh, clothing and can be very uncomfortable. Um, Posterior drooling, uh, you have saliva that spills uh, in the uh, back of the throat and um, lead in some cases to aspiration, but not in every case. There are times where it's just pooling there and uh, can be quite uncomfortable. Um, I've had uh, one conversation with uh, an adolescent who could explain to me uh, the feeling of... Um, drowning on their secretions, which is very, very unpleasant uh, feeling. Uh, and if you cannot uh, measure the problem, you will never be able to improve it. And, and there are uh, so many scales that have been uh, developed, none of which are perfect. A lot are based on subjective assessments. We've developed our own scale at the saliva clinic, which is very extensive and 
tries to capture the impact of the drooling on the child as well as on the caregivers because there's an impact on the caregivers um, and then look at the uh, health perspective as well as the comfort perspective uh, and then one uh, study we did recently uh, trying to simplify things um, has sh um, shown that if we um, look at bib count in children or uh, for older kids or adults the number of times they have to wipe themselves that there is a good um, correlation with the frequency and the severity of uh, drooling and this correlation was present despite the variability and the lack of standardization <laughs> so etiologies of drooling um, uh, limited um, oral motor control, decreased uh, sensory awareness. At times, it's related to poor head or posture control, uh, inefficient swallowing or decreased frequency of swallowing, and at times uh, related to um, neurological uh, coordinations. Uh, etiologies can include, uh, at times, malocclusion, uh, and at times, um, airway factors like uh, nasal congestion, uh, large adenoids leading to mouth breathing, uh, reflux, and at times it can be related to uh, some uh, medication. Um, this is a uh, long time ago when I used to have more hair and uh, when we established uh, a multidisciplinary team approach. And the reason we did that, and, and there's a reference uh, to that in case it helps some centers build such a clinic is um, to be able to look at these issues um, from multiple uh, perspectives. And and because there is a role to a team and, and on the uh, picture before um, you see um, a, a dentist, a pediatrician, a neurologist, a social worker, as well as a occupational and a speech therapist. And uh, each member of this team have a role, uh, the occupational therapist um, or, and or the speech therapists are involved in determining the frequency and severity of drooling. Uh, they're looking at the child's profile, muscle tone, posture, uh, and uh, other motor language uh, abilities or motor skills, sensory aspects, as well as uh, saliva swallowing and feeding. Uh, the social worker had an important role to look at the impact on the child and the family, as well as what is the priority of intervention, because there are times where drooling may not be the priority and there are other uh, important concerns. And the dentist was involved with uh, um, oral musculature, occlusion of the teeth, tongue position, but also uh, oral health and uh, habits. Uh, as a uh, airway surgeon, I was looking at the health burden of drooling, uh, excluding aspiration or posterior um, uh, drooling, looking at airway safety and documenting the severity of drooling, as well as identifying good candidates for medical or uh, surgical uh, options. Um, Always important to think beyond the saliva. Like, uh, yes, um, the patient has a lot of uh, salivary problems, but is it really saliva we're dealing with? Or could it be that there is reflux, uh, chronic lung issues with secretions, uh, immune issues, or could it be um, also related to some of the medication? Um, so we've developed uh, at McGill uh, a multidisciplinary approach where it's not only uh, a multidisciplinary team, but also uh, the approach is more comprehensive where uh, for every child we look at how can we help them not only with medication or surgery, but uh, really with a comprehensive approach looking at rehab options, medical options and surgical options. and these options um, uh, are complementary in a sense that we find sometimes that a combination of options is really the best approach. And uh, with rehab options, it includes correcting situational factors uh, such as posture or um, positioning issues, oral motor therapy, and uh, at times oral appliances or sensory programs. Uh, medical treatment options I'll get into include anticholinergics or uh, botulinum toxin injections. 
and uh, surgical options can be divided into um, two pathways, either diverting the saliva, uh, so uh, it uh, is not uh, pooling or reducing the quantity of saliva. And then what to consider uh, depends really on what are the factors that contribute to drooling, and I've shared with you that it's multifactorial. What is the impact on the child and their caregiver? What are the needs, priorities, availabilities, and um, and also the rehab uh, prognosis? Uh, rehab options, uh, looking at posture, uh, positioning, head control, oral motor sensory therapy, behavior therapy, and compensatory strategies, and posture, positioning, head control include aligning um, the body, looking at the shoulder, girdle, trunk, pelvis being stable, uh, and also supporting the head. Um, and uh, compensatory strategies can include, at times, a uh, slant board uh, covering uh, the keyboards or communication devices because parents report that often these uh, break. Um, and uh, at times using different um, reminders um, or, or a, a wristband uh, when appropriate. Um, at times it could be uh, just thinking outside the box with other compensatory strategies like black or patterned clothing, uh, turtleneck, and, and other uh, strategies. Um, we've shown uh, in one of our studies that there is clearly an impact on the uh, health uh, of the um, teeth and the oral hygiene and health uh, related to decreasing saliva. So uh, all our children were we intervened on decreasing the saliva. We ensure that they have a thorough uh, and um, um, good uh, dental uh, follow-up. Uh, for the medication, it can be divided into um, two families, anticholinergic agents, and there are a number of them, and uh, botulinum toxin injections, uh, which uh, now we have a number of options uh, that we can inject to decrease the uh, saliva production. For surgical uh, drooling options, I've talked about two main strategies, either divert the saliva or reduce the saliva. Uh, saliva diversion, uh, we can do it for anterior drooling when the problem is that there is spillage of the, the saliva um, in, in children or adults with aspiration. It's not a good idea because it can make their aspiration worse. So we look at options then to reduce the saliva, such as uh, removing some mandibular gland or uh, blocking a duct uh, to decrease the uh, saliva production. In uh, severe uh, posterior drooling where there is aspiration, and, and these are very severe cases, many of these uh, um, adults or children have chronic pulmonary damage or are in intensive care unit with recurrent pneumonias, then we have uh, more um, invasive options to protect the airway uh, if that is uh, appropriate. What has been uh, shown in a recent review uh, in, in there's one message from the slide is there are many, many surgical options and that uh, they have a pretty good success rate. So the overall success rate is 80%. It's not 100. It's 80% with a confidence interval of 77 to 85%. Um, in case uh, uh, this can be beneficial to uh, some, uh, this is the uh, saliva management clinic I was uh, referring to, and uh, I put the website because th there are some resources there that uh, might be helpful. And then uh, moving on to uh, dysphagia, and I I'd like to mention that this problem, um, not only in leukodystrophy, but uh, in, in all of the pediatric population, we're seeing that there is an increased uh, prevalence of uh, dysphagia. And uh, same concept as with drooling, uh, we've set a, a complex dysphagia clinic that includes uh, many specialties, uh, gastroenterologists, uh, surgeon or laryngologist, respirologist, pediatrician, nurses, nutritionists, and occupational therapists, and a feeding uh, specialist. And um, what, what's the importance of having this multidisciplinary approach is um, when, when you come at it from a different 
professional's perspective is a better identification of the patient's needs rather than a tunnel vision of a single specialty. Um, it allows continuity of family-centered care, access to the health professionals, rather than having families go to five different appointments on different days and have physicians communicate through medical records and dictations and notes. Uh, physicians communicate and, and health professionals, not only physicians, communicate face-to-face -face and discuss um, each uh, case. And uh, so it's convenient to the families and there is ongoing education, better coordination of care and uh, definitely increase quality of life and decrease wait time uh, for being seen or procedures. There are different types of dysphagia or difficulty swallowing, and they can be related to various phases of swallow. Uh, some are related to the oral phase, uh, be it absent oral reflexes or neurological reflexes or different coordination issues. It could be related to uh, triggering of the swallow reflex and at times related to the pharyngeal phase where, uh, as you know, part of the airway intersects uh, with a swallowing uh, pipe and uh, that puts us at risk for aspiration and uh, choking. Uh, very complex in that when we look at, again, uh, etiologies for swallowing problems, many structures can be involved and that's, that's the point of this busy slide. And when there are many problems, there are many solutions. Uh, so sometimes it's modifying the fluid, at times modifying the food, at times special feeding equipment, and at times special feeding strategies. And rarely, sometimes even surgical interventions, which I will show quickly. This is the, a, a child that had a spasm of the cricopharyngeus that was very tight and preventing uh, food from going down. And uh, what we performed was a, a laser uh, procedure uh, to cut that muscle and uh, allow uh, for the food to uh, go down um, by gravity. So to show that in some cases there are um, other solutions um, as long as um, there's a multidisciplinary approach and, and thinking outside uh, the box. It doesn't want to advance. Let me try. Um, so in uh, conclusion, um, I hope I shared with you that uh, drooling and or dysphagia can have a significant impact on uh, adults and children with uh, these issues and, and not only um, adults or children with these issues, but also their families, uh, quality of life and uh, a multidisciplinary uh, evaluation is needed. Uh, these are um, issues with uh, complex uh, factors, many factors that contribute to the problem. So many factors, you need many solutions and there are different treatment options that exists and, and I think what has been wonderful in the healthcare community is uh, more and more interdisciplinary care where uh, people work together rather than silo uh, work and, and tunnel vision and the combination of treatment options including rehab medical and surgical options are um, much better than a single option because alone we can do so little and uh, together, uh, just like you show us today with uh, the community coming together, you can do so much. So uh, thank you for being here. And uh, uh, it's been a privilege and an honor to be part of your uh, day today.